My senior year in high school, the song We Are the World came out. It was such a big hit. It was meant to raise money for the famine that was happening in Africa. And it brought together uh, a bunch of artists, popular artists from the time, to sing this song, We Are the World. And as I was a senior in high school, uh, some of us got together and we had this idea that for uh, the closing of our senior talent program, that we would all get together and sing We Are the World in, in, and set up very similar to how they set up in the music video. And so I ordered the sheet music, we got everybody together, and because I was one of the people that was kind of spearheading this, I thought this was my chance that I was going to be able to sing, especially since everybody is basically singing a line or two. And so I, and I, we were get, getting everybody together, we put out all the parts, and we were assigning people different parts, and I was able to somehow finagle it so that I would sing Al Jarreau's part. And it was just one line, and I thought, this is going to be it, this is going to be my chance to just be able to sing in front of everybody. And so I did it. I finagled it, and we got to the first practice, and everyone was there. And listen, you have to understand that this, my class, I, I don't mean to brag, but it was a pretty talented class when it came to singing. A lot of them were in uh, a couple of groups that sang. Uh, a couple of my classmates went on to uh, release albums and go on tour, and, and uh, I think they all have Grammys, and, and it's just really, really impressive. But I thought I was gonna be, and I didn't know all of this back then, we were still in high school, and I thought this is gonna be my chance. And so we were there practicing, and we had a microphone set up, and everybody had their parts and knew what they were going to do. And so the, there was one microphone, and the rest of the class, which was the majority of the class, was sitting out there just watching everybody. And then the song came on, and we started to sing, and everybody started to get through, and all the parts came by. And here comes my part, Al Jarreau's part. And I'm not even going to try to sing it, but the words are, and so we all must lend a helping hand. And I was just getting into it, I was just getting into it. And as I saw my part approaching, I was trying to find the key that it was in. And so we, and so we, and so we, and I couldn't find it. And I just, I, I couldn't hear where, what that note was that I was supposed to start at. And all of a sudden I started to panic. And I could feel the sweat starting to bead up at the top of my hairline. And, I, and, and it was at that moment, at that very moment, when it was almost time for me to start singing, that this moment of clarity just came to me where I suddenly realized I don't know how to sing. It was amazing. I just knew it. And instead of saying to myself, no, I can't do this. You know what I thought to myself? I thought anybody can sing this. And I started to sing it off key. I don't think I hit a single note. I didn't even look around and see the faces around me, although I could imagine them, but I just knew how horrible it was. And then at the next practice, someone else was singing Al Jarreau's part. It's one of those moments that people say to you, you know how people will come to, up to you after an embarrassing moment or a huge mistake that you make in your life, and they'll say, don't worry, one day you're going to look back on this and laugh. Liars. I don't look back on it and laugh. I look back on it and cringe. And we all know this. We've all experienced this. That one moment when we're, we're in trouble and we know we're in trouble and everything just becomes crystal clear and we realize how much trouble that we're really in. Now, this was a little mistake. But I got to tell you that as I've lived my life, I've had huge mistakes, huge mistakes that I've made. Probably some of you have had huge mistakes in your life. In fact, I wager to guess that most of you, maybe all of you, who are here with us today, who are watching us online, have made a huge mistake in our lives. Maybe even more. And listen, if you happen to be sitting next to the huge mistake in your life, please, ladies, don't elbow your husband right now. You can do that a little bit later. Well, we are in our series, Facing Your Giants, and what we've been doing is, over the last four weeks, we've been taking a deep dive into the life of perhaps the most famous giant killer of all, a man named David, who started out as a shepherd boy and ended up becoming king of ancient Israel. And David killed a Goliath. He killed his giant. And so a very, very popular story, even if you're not a Christian, you've heard the story of David killing Goliath. We use that as a metaphor today in culture, in business to talk about the little guy beating the big guy. 
But you know that David faced more than one giant? More than one. Goliath had four brothers, and all his brothers were also giants. David and his men faced them and defeated all four of his brothers. But those aren't the giants that I'm talking about. See, every week in the series, we've seen that the giants that David faced in his life are giants that you and I face in our lives too. And in the first week, we talked about how finding and fulfilling our potential was important. We talked about the tools that we need to face down those giants. The giant that wants us to settle for a life of insignificance and mediocrity. And then we talked about what to do when winning costs us everything, because there's a giant out there too that wants you to give up when life is too hard. We talked about what to do when we feel like we're running on empty so that we can face the giants of mental and emotional and spiritual exhaustion that come into our lives. And last week we talked about setting the right priorities because there's a giant out there that wants your life to lack focus and purpose. If you've missed any of these messages, You can see all of them at our website. Links to them are on our website at wearegracepoint.com. Click the button that says podcast, and there's links to all of our previous messages. But listen, every week has been about a different giant that David faced. And we've talked about how these are the same giants that you and I face. And so far, every week we've gone through, David has won out over these giants. But not this week. So this week, we're going to talk about the giant that finally got David. It's the giant of regret. Do you know that a recent study said that 47% of Americans say that they're dealing with regret and the emotional aftermath of a bad decision that they've made? 47%. That's half the country. Half the country is weighed down by some choice that they made in the past, and they wish that they could just have a do-over. And so I think that you and I, we need to talk about how to get past our past. How do we recover from the worst mistake that we've ever made? Now, I want you to to give a little bit of context to what David is dealing with here, because this is a situation that that was the one that got David. And I put uh, we're going to put the scriptures on uh, on the screen for you to follow along with us. But if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps and you want to follow along, we want you to follow along, too, because what we're going to be talking about is how to get past our mistakes and start over again. And so we're not going to focus so much on David's mistakes as much as we are going to focus on what David did afterwards. So in the manuscript, which turned into a book called 2 Samuel in the 11th chapter, the author starts out with this very interesting, very odd phrase. Listen to what he says. He says, in the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Now, this is weird because when you read about David's life, you realize that he wasn't good at very much. He was a very good shepherd when he was a boy, and he was a very good singer-songwriter. In fact, we know that a majority of the psalms in the scriptures are actually songs that David wrote. They're the lyrics to songs that David wrote. But other than that, the only other thing that David was really, really good at was fighting. David was a warrior. And so it's kind of strange that at the time of the year, the most strategic time of the year, where kings go out and fight to gain wealth and to expand their kingdom, this king decides to stay home. He instead gives the responsibility to one of his generals, and even the general thought it was strange. In fact, later on when General Joab was about to fully invade the city of Rabbah. He sends a messenger back to David saying, Hey, king, I think you better get down here because we are about to take over the city. And if you're not here, people are going to start thinking that it was me that did it. I'm going to be the one to get all the credit for defeating the Ammonites. You better get down here. And it's not long before David realizes that it was a mistake for him to have stayed home. All of his friends are in the battle. He has no one to hang out with. In fact, Scripture says that before David made his worst mistake ever, he had just woken up from a midday nap. So think about David. He's all alone. 
he's lonely, he's bored, that is a lethal combination to a person's moral compass. So one day David is walking along his rooftop and he looks down and he sees what Scripture describes as an unusually beautiful woman who is bathing. So he says to one of his aides, he says, hey, who's that? And his aide says, uh, that's Bathsheba. That's Eliam's daughter and Uriah's wife. You see, what the aide is saying, as respectful as he, as he can, he's saying, yo, bro, okay, no, he's not bro. He's like, okay, king, check it out. You, you got to understand this. That woman that you were looking at, that woman who you can't take your eyes off, that woman is some man's baby girl. And that woman is some man's wife. And not just any man. Uriah was one of David's best friends. But David doesn't listen or David doesn't get it. And so he has, he sends for her to come to the palace. And when she gets to the palace, they start chatting, talking, and then pretty soon they sleep together. And just like in every predictable daytime or nighttime soap opera that you and I have ever watched, a few weeks later, they find out that Bathsheba is pregnant. And David's like, crap. Because now he's in a tough spot. See, in that time, adultery was a capital offense. And once the baby was born, well, David could deny that the baby was his, but that would mean certain death for Bathsheba. So what was David going to do? Was he going to tell people what happened, apologize? No. What David did was he tried to cover up his affair. He says, okay, what am I going to do here? So he calls Uriah back. He has this plan. He tells Uriah to come home and get some R&R, rest and relaxation. And he's hoping that when he comes home, Uriah will sleep with his wife. And then when the baby comes, they will think that it's Uriah's baby. But Uriah is a stand-up guy. And he says, I'm not going to go and, and um, enjoy being here when all of my men are out there fighting. So he refuses to go home to see his wife. And so David says, oh, this isn't going to work. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get him drunk. So David has, has him, um, gets him drunk, and he's hoping that when he's drunk, he's going to go and do what David wants him to do. But Uriah has more integrity drunk than David has sober. And so Uriah doesn't do it. And David's like, well, this isn't working. So David has another plan. David sends Uriah back into the battle. And along with Uriah, he sends a messenger to General Joab. And he tells Joab to send Uriah and his men up to the part where the hardest fighting is happening. And then he says, listen, after you get everybody up there and they're all fighting, tell everyone else to slowly pull back so that Uriah is fighting by himself. And I don't know what General Joab was thinking, but when the king gives you an order, you do it. And so that's what they did. And Uriah was killed. The word gets back. Uriah died in battle. And so David, again, trying to cover up his affair, takes Bathsheba as his wife, his third wife. He's still married to the two other women. Now, that was bad. And you might even argue but that that was David's worst mistake, but it definitely wasn't his last one. Listen, the truth is, we all have a worst mistake. And it doesn't have to be murder or adultery to qualify as our worst mistake. You have a secret, and chances are no one knows about it. Maybe you're in a relationship with someone and you've started to develop, to develop feelings for someone else. Or maybe you're the one that's in charge of the finances at your house and, and you've been mishandling the money and you haven't told anybody about it and, and now... No one knows how bad the financial situation is that you're in. Or maybe you've got this great job. Finally, you got the job that you've always wanted. But you're not really qualified for it. And the only reason you got it is because you lied about your experience or your qualifications. There's lots of ways for us to make a mistake that qualifies as our worst mistake. And listen, I'm guessing that since half the country is living in regret, then there's probably a lot of us out there. It's probably a lot of us who are here, who are watching us online, who are dealing with it too. And here's the thing. Maybe you're not dealing it with it, you're not dealing with it right now, but I guarantee you that if you're not dealing it with it right now, one day you will be. 
And so it's probably in your best interest to see what it is that David did. So here's the question. How do you recover from your worst mistake ever? We're going to see what David did as we continue looking at 2 Samuel 12, but we're also going to look at one of the songs that David wrote, Psalm 51, how to recover from our worst mistake ever. The first thing that we have to do to recover from our worst mistake ever is to confess, to say, I've made a huge mistake. See, secrets make you sick. Secrets make you sick. And the first step for recovering from your worst mistake is to confess it. You have to take responsibility for what you did wrong by verbally owning it. See, obviously God knew what David was up to. God knew everything that David was doing, and God wasn't happy about it. So what God does is he sends a prophet, a prophet named Nathan, to go to David and to send a message. So Nathan goes to David, and and he tells David a story. Now listen, I don't have time to read it right now, but you should read it. In fact, write this down somewhere or go ahead and open it up in your Bible so, and put something there so you can read it later. But it's in 2 Samuel 12, 1 to 12. This is the story that Nathan tells David. And it is one of the most heartbreaking stories that you'll ever read in all of Scripture. And so Nathan goes to David and tells him this story and this is what happens. He says, so the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. See, David, who probably thought he had gotten away with the perfect crime, was still racked with guilt and shame. And God uses Nathan to bring David face to face with his sin. And David makes the right decision in all this mess. He, the first right decision that he's made in all of these things that he's gone through, he confesses it. Basically, David is saying to God, I have made a huge mistake. So the question that you and I have to ask ourselves is, is who do I need to talk to? Who do you need to talk to? Who do you need to call or to have a cup of coffee with? Who do you need to meet with face to face and verbally take responsibility for something that you did wrong? Come on, you already know who it is. As we've been talking about this, a picture came to your mind. You know who that is. And I just want to encourage you to just take a second right now and to write their name down. And if you don't want to write their name because you're afraid that somebody is going to see it, then just put their initials or put a mark or draw a little picture that will remind you of it. And then today, after we are done with our time together, sometime today, go ahead and make that call. So for some of you, the situation may be complicated enough that you need to get the help of a counselor to help you sort it out first. And if you need help with that, listen, get a hold of me. You can um, message me if you're watching us online, uh, direct message us, and we'll get a hold of you. But we, have, we, we might be able to guide you or to lead you towards resources where you can get that kind of help. But listen, whatever help it is, whatever you decide to do, don't let this weekend pass without doing something. And then, once we've confessed that we've made a huge mistake, and if we need help recovering from your mistake, the second thing we want to do is to ask God for a new beginning. Listen, after Nathan leaves, David writes a song. And I I don't know what David named the song back then. It probably had a much cooler name than what we call the song today, because today we refer to the song as Psalm 51. But listen to what David says. He says, Have mercy on me, O God. Because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. You notice how David says, because of your, he says it there twice. What is, God, what is David asking God for? He's asking God for mercy, and he's asking God for grace. Now, sometimes we we can use those words interchangeably, but you know that they actually have two very distinct, very different meanings. Mercy means not getting what you deserve. See, David knew that he deserved to be punished for the horrible things that he did. And he was asking God for mercy, to not get what he deserved. But grace, grace is getting what you don't deserve. 
See, David asks God to blot out the stains of his sin. Do you see what he's asking for? He's saying, God, listen, would you just please treat me as if I had never done this thing in the first place? Would you just, can, can you and I just go back to where I was and to what I was doing right before I made this huge mistake? And can everything just be okay? Can everything be good? Can we just be cool again like we were before I messed up? Now listen, that's a pretty audacious ask for David. But it is a request that God loves to answer. Look at what one of Jesus' closest friends who who, who spent the most time, one of, spent, one of the ones that spent the most time with Jesus, who was taught personally by Jesus, who knew Jesus and understood what Jesus was teaching. Listen to what a man named John wrote about this entire idea of, of, of God blotting out the stains of our mistakes and our sin. He says, if we confess our sins to him, he can be depended on to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. And it is perfectly proper for God to do this for us because Christ died to wash away our sins. Wash away our sins. Blot out the stain of our sins. That's exactly what David is asking for. Look at the lyrics of his song again. He says, wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. David's saying, I know what I did wrong, and it's eating me up inside. I can't eat, I can't focus during the day, I can't sleep at night, and it's all because of how badly I rebelled against you, God. That's the reason why I can't sleep. And we've had nights where we just couldn't sleep either. We don't deserve mercy and grace. But we can go to God. And we can ask for mercy and grace, not because of who we are, not because we deserve it, but we can ask because of who God is. God loves to answer those prayers, and He can answer those prayers because of how good God is and how big God is. And listen, when we sin, it doesn't impact or change one tiny little bit of who God is. That's why God is so capable of forgiving so quickly and so completely. And God is the only one who is capable of doing that. See, our sin doesn't change anything about God, but it sure does impact and change the people we've hurt because of our bad choices. And one of the most, actually, I think the most frustrating part for the person who's trying to recover from their mistake is this is that the person that we have sinned against doesn't recover from our mistake as quickly as we do or as quickly as we think they should. We have this imaginary timeline in our head and there's this point where we, ex we expect that the other person has had enough time and they should just get over it. And when they don't get over it, we just start to think that it's their fault because they won't get over it. And we're pretty quick to accuse them of being judgmental or being unforgiving. And if you've ever felt those things before, then this is going to get even more frustrating for you. Because listen, you have no control, nor do you have any right to decide when someone is going to forgive you. You have no control and no right to decide when someone else is going to forgive you. Listen, you may be right. They may be filled with unforgiveness and resentment, and they may be hurting themselves more than they are hurting you. But there is nothing that you can do about it. You just have to choose to be patient with the process that they're going through. In fact, there are only three things that you can do about it. Number one, you can pray to God that they will find or that God will lead a safe person into their life, someone who is willing and able to help walk them through whatever forgiveness process that they need to go through. Because you won't be able to do it. But then also, you can make sure that you don't let, you don't let your identity come from anything other than Jesus Christ. You see, when we let who we are be defined by another person's decision, 
to forgive us or to not forgive us, we're giving that person to decide who we are. And you can fully recover from your past mistake. You can get your past into your past. It can be in the rearview mirror and never get forgiveness from the person that you've hurt. And I know that it's painful, but it's true. You can get past it even if the person you've hurt never forgives you. Brene Brown, who is a, a great psychologist and, and has a, a couple of great books, she says this, and I love this quote. She says, I made a mistake. But I'm not a mistake. You may have made a mistake in your life. You made a huge mistake in your life. But you are not a huge mistake. And the only way that we can really believe that is by letting our identity come from Jesus Christ and from who he says that we are instead of who other people say that we are. Because if we let other people decide who we are, we have a tendency to live into that. And we'll never be able to get our worst mistake into our past. And then the third thing is this. Don't confuse consequences as condemnation. Listen, good or bad, there are always consequences to your actions. Good actions generally have good consequences. And bad actions, most of the time, have bad consequences. Bad consequences communicate that you did something that you shouldn't have done. It doesn't communicate what your value or worth as a person is. David gets this, right? He knows that there will be and that there should be consequences for his actions. Listen to what he says. He writes this, in, he says, against you and you alone have I sinned, talking about God. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. See, there are both natural and divine consequences for our actions. But we shouldn't confuse consequences with condemnation. In fact, the Apostle Paul, who wrote much of what we call today the New Testament, would remind us, he said, because of God's goodness, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, because of all of these things, he says, so now, because of those situations now, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. That's the beauty of being a follower of Jesus. It's all about who Jesus is and what he did, and not about who I am or what I've done, or what I'm doing or what I'm going to do. You see, when you belong to Jesus, you're joined together with him. And because of what he did on the cross, you are no longer judged by what you did, you are judged by what he did. You are not who other people say you are, you are who Jesus says you are. Before Jesus, we all lived under the condemnation of our mistakes, but not anymore. And if you're feeling condemned because of your bad choices, it's either because you don't belong to Jesus yet, or you've simply forgotten who you are because of Jesus. We can't avoid the negative consequences of our mistakes, but those consequences are never a sign that God has somehow changed his mind about you. And the next thing that we do is that we don't just be sorry be different. Don't just be sorry. Be different. Sorry is good, but different is better. Sorry stops the bleeding, but different actually heals the hurt. Different is what rebuilds trust with someone you hurt. And listen, different takes time. You have to be different for a while for the other person to feel that you're safe enough to trust again. The reality is, is that people are much more fragile than you think that they are. You are much more fragile than you think you are. David understood this. Listen to what David says. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew, renew a loyal spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. David says, make me willing to obey you. Because on that rooftop, looking down at that unusually beautiful woman, David wasn't willing to obey God. 
He wasn't willing to do life God's way. And then David says this. Listen to what he says. He says, you do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. You see, in this time period where David is writing this, part of the reason that you gave a sacrifice was to show how sorry you were. And David knows that that's not really what God wants from him right now. The sacrifice that God wants is a broken spirit because a broken spirit is willing to let God lead. A rebellious spirit wants to do what it wants to do. But a broken spirit is willing to let God lead. And sacrifice, giving a sacrifice, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a broken spirit. In fact, there are a lot of people who give a sacrifice and still have a rebellious spirit And when you're like that, it doesn't mean anything. We've seen this. You've seen this. You ever have someone do something that hurt you? And then they come up to you and they say, sorry. Sorry. All right, sorry. Fine, sorry. And you can just tell they don't really mean it. They're saying the words, but they don't really mean what they're saying. It's just words to them. What makes the difference is the actions. And so when David wrote this, I believe that he wrote this and he had this moment of clarity finally. The light bulb turned on and he could finally see clearly. And he remembered the reason that God made him king because the guy before him had a rebellious spirit too. And because of his rebellious spirit, God removed the anointing off of him and put it on David. You can see it in this conversation that the prophet who anointed David as king, Samuel, had with Saul, who was the king before David. Listen to this conversation. But Samuel replied to King Saul. He said, what is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than the offering, offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. Was Saul sorry? Yes. But God didn't just want sorry. God wanted different. And when you're trying to recover from your worst mistake ever, sorry will only get you so far. You have to be choose. You have to choose to be different too. And then lastly, celebrate your new beginning and take it one day at a time. See, it, it says... Take it one day at a time as if, as if you have a choice, but really you don't have a choice. You have to take it one day at a time. And sometimes it's hard. I know that. Sometimes we get into the space where we've done something to hurt somebody and we just want it to go away. Remember a few years back there was an Adam Sandler movie called Click? where Adam Sandler goes to Bed Bath & Beyond and there's the bed stuff and the bath stuff and then there's a door that has Beyond and... And uh, Christopher Walken is there and he says, what do you need? And he grabs this remote and this remote lets Adam Sandler like fast forward through his life. So whenever there's a bad spot or a bad situation, something he didn't want to deal with, he'd just click it and he'd fast forward through it. And then one day he realizes that he's fast forwarded through his entire life. He skipped over the hard parts of life. then he realizes that the hard parts of life is all of life. Because listen, life is messy. And sure, we wish we could just skip over the messy parts and just sail through into the the easy times. We want to skip over the tough times so we can avoid the pain and so that we can feel better. But listen, life happens in those painful moments. Growth happens in those painful moments. We learn lessons in those painful moments. There are lessons that we learn in the pain that we can't learn anywhere else. And oftentimes, out of our deepest pains, out of our deepest mistakes, out of uh, uh, those, those empty periods, we experience the greatest love and compassion and friendship that we've ever experienced. It comes out of those painful times. So we all know this. Trust takes time to rebuild. Not just between you and the person you've hurt, 
but it takes time to rebuild trust between you and God. Not God's trust in you, but your trust in God. Listen to to, uh, what David writes. He says, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. See, David is saying that you have to take this new life one day at a time because Jesus wants to help guide you along the best pathway of your life. And it is a pathway that can only be found and followed one step at a time, one day at a time. And in that, the Lord promises to guide you, to advise you, to watch over you. But this means that you have to learn to trust God enough to slow down and to ask Him for advice and to let Him guide you. 